Welcome everyone to BT's On The Fly. Tonight, we're with FFI Women's Connect. We're gonna tie a yuck muddler. So what the heck is that? More about that in a moment. But let's switch things over to Sandy so she can tell you all about the Women's Connect organization. Hey, everybody. Oh, thank you, Al. You did a spotlight on me. Um, I'm Sandy Carpenter. Most of you know me. Oh, now I get the whole spotlight. Have you been here with me, Gretchen? Um, I'm vice chair of Women Connect. Gretchen BDA. We are at a, and, and Kathy Crofts and Patty's over here and Mona and we're in Key Largo. See what happens when you join Women Connect. You get to go to a fly tying school in great places. So we're at a, we're, we're going to be doing a three day fly tying school. So if you don't have our address, it's women connect at flyfishersinternational.org. And I get on the mailing list. We'll invite you to all this stuff. We have trips coming up. We'll invite you to those. Um, our look at our Facebook page, FFI Women Connect. Look at our Facebook group, Women Connect at Fly Fishers International. Join our group because everything is also post, posted there. March is fly fishing, the fountain of youth. So we have fishing with kids and we have kids tying and we have April Vokey talking about how she fished with babies. And we have Castine Coleman talking about how she fished with toddlers. And on February 28th is a all FFI webinar and it will be Molly Semenik talking about spay. So, and if you are an FFI member, you got the invite for that. Um, look on the FFI Fly Fishers International webpage and join that webinar. And it's not interactive like this and fun and talk. It's it's more like a presentation. So join us, join us for that. And then um, the webinar series will start. That's that's the start off of uh, the webinar series. And then um, it will be Tuesday nights is the Women Connect deal. So, thank you, Sandy. I, that was um, good to see you all. Good to see my wife for the first time, and I can't tell you when. A thousand miles away from where I am, so that's an unusual experience. But tonight, let's take a look at the recipe for a minute. The yuck muddler. Well, actually, the yuck muddler is a takeoff of the yuck bug, which I'm going to tie first. I didn't even put a a um, recipe up for it. You'll see it as, as we move along. It's almost identical to the yuck muddler, except it doesn't have a deer hair head. You can see we've got hooks in a range of sizes, two to 16, two to four X long. Thread brown, or I think I got some black around here too. A squirrel tail. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Going to use a brown yarn body for some of it. And the yuck bug that I'll tie for you first off will have a chenille body. I'm gonna use brown hackle, but you can use any color you happen to have. On the yuck muddler, we'll have a collar of deer hair and a spun head. Now let's move over to the materials. There they are. <clears throat> what I wanted to talk to you about is this squirrel tail. You see how nice and wide that is? Stripe down the middle, you got a black stripe down each side. That doesn't just happen. It, um, requires the use of a hair dryer on a warm setting or I used a heat gun on a low setting. What that does is it sp spreads the hair out when you spray it or when you when you put the air on it and it puts all those markings in line. Isn't that cool? Really nice. And we'll be using that. We'll be able to use that straight off the tail without stacking it. Okay, we're going to be using hackle on our flies. I've already got some brown ones size, so I'll just set those over at the vise. We don't need to have them in my way. Here's some, a ball of chenille. I'll set that over as well. I'll be using that on the first one. Um, we're going to tie two versions of the yuck bug tonight, along with the, uh, oh no, excuse me, two versions of the yuck muddler and the yuck bug. One of them, we're going to be using this um, yarn. Let me move over to the vise for just a minute. Now that's the yuck, the yuck muddler. But what I wanted to show you is the, is the yarn. This is two strands left from what had originally been four strands. I've been using off this piece. And what I'm going to do is show you something you can do with your hair dryer, or for you guys that happen to have um, 
a, a heat gun for doing heat shrink over electrical wires and so forth. Uh, that works too, but you want to keep it on a low setting. But what I'm doing right here now is making a mess. Well, I've got a little bit there. I got it all tangled up and uh, you can still see it's got some kinks in it. What I'm going to do is move over to the materials area and show you how to take those kinks out so it's perfectly straight. We'll do that. Gretchen, I sure miss you switching the cameras for me. Now I got to stop and do all that myself. I'll be glad when you're home. Okay, now I'm hanging that piece of yarn right here in this clip. And I'm going to take another clip and hook it on. And I'm going to get my heat gun. That's a heat. I want you to notice that that's still kinky. But when I put the hair dryer on it, even on a low, or not the hair dryer, but the the heat gun, let me put that gun away now. And then I'll get back, get that material back over at the vise, because I want you to see what happened to that. This is a trick that's going to be really handy for all of your fly tying. And there's many more materials than just this yarn. Here we are, that same piece of yarn that was all kinky. See how nice and straight that is? With just a very light application of warm air from a hair dryer or a heat gun. But remember, if you use a heat gun, it can be too hot and you can burn things up. So let's set this roadmap fly out aside for the moment. We'll get back to that in a little bit. We're, we're going to start by tying just a standard yuck bug. And we'll do that by placing a hook in the vise. And I'll reach over to the materials area and grab my thread. And I want you to notice that I'm starting slightly back from the hook eye. Want to want to give myself plenty of room here in front so that I don't crowd the eye when I'm finishing the fly. It's really important for any of you looking on from from Key Largo. The um, crowding the hook eye is one of the things that you want to avoid. We call that material creep. The tendency of those materials when you when you walk off to get a cup of coffee, all the materials on your hook will sneak forward and get closer and closer to the hook eye. And when it comes time to finish the fly you'll find there's no room left for the last couple of things you need to do. That's because of material creep. So you have to defeat material creep by staying back away from the hook eye to start out. Everything you do is staying back away from where you think you need to be. Now, I am going to just grab my squirrel tail. It sure lines those bars up nice and there's no stacking done or anything. All that, all that was done with the heat gun or a hair dryer. But anyway, let me uh, just pull a bundle of that off to the side and I'll cut it off. I'll set that back over in the materials area. And I'm just gonna go ahead and tie that on the hook. Pull the waist out. And I want that tail to be about um maybe three quarters the length of the hook shank and that would be about it so that's going to be about that much right there let me slip off camera for a moment and cut off the waist so it doesn't get all over the camera so one of the things about doing these zoom presentations is you have a camera to deal with and the lens of your camera does not appreciate all the waste from your fly tying materials going all over it doesn't make for a good presentation. Now there's our tail in place, a little long, but it'll do. I prefer them a little longer than shorter. And we're going to just take a piece of this chenille and tie it on the hook here. And here's a trick that you'll probably find, learn from Gretchen tomorrow when you do your well, first fly in the class down there for those of you tuning in from Key Largo. And what I just did is I tore some of the chenille off the end and just left the thread in the center. And what that does is keeps the materials from building up too much. Just, okay, good. 
Now we'll just set that aside. Let me get one of my hackles. I'm just, I've got three of them here. I wanted to make sure I didn't run out. So what I'll probably end up doing is dropping them all in the trash or something like that. Like I just did with the one I, I took out of the clip. Now I have to go digging in the trash to get it out. <clears throat> here it is. I'll get this other stuff out of here too. Okay, I'll get rid of that. <clears throat> you thought I was joking about the trash. Well, I wasn't. Okay, I'm going to tie this on the hook. So it's at the back. You can see we're getting quite a bit of material stacked up here at the back. I want you to notice one thing though. In fact, I have to make an adjustment here. Right here at the back of the hook, I made certain that I don't have fibers right down at the hook. What I what I don't want to do, and let me let me redo this and I'll show you what I what I'm avoiding. What I don't want to do is tie that feather to the shank right there where the fibers start. And that's a mistake an awful lot of people make. And I want you to notice what happens. You see how those fibers kick back right back here? That doesn't look nice. When all you have to do is let me loosen this up just a little bit. I'll pull that out so that I have some bare stem. You see that? You can see the stem now. And then so when I get ready to wrap that, it'll just fall in line and you won't have waste fibers sticking back into the tail. Does it make any difference to the fish? Nope. But it makes makes a difference to, to me, the fly tire. And if you don't care, well, then that's fine too. All right. Now the original yuck bug is a Montana fly. I cannot tell you anything about it other than the only place I've seen it is in Montana. And I'll tell you what, the browns in the fall just go crazy over this thing. When you, um, when you cast it to the bank from a drift boat, a couple of strips, pick it up, cast it back to the bank again. And uh, we call that pounding the bank. And it's something you do every fall. And yuck bugs are the go-to fly for that purpose. Notice how the I tied those on and I now I ease them down on the sides of the hook. Let me flip this around so you can see what I'm doing. There we go. And I am going to now use the point of my scissors to pull the legs apart. Okay, and go ahead and wrap back just a little bit further. And I'm going to cut the legs. Uh, they're about the right length. Let's take a look here. Yep, that looks pretty good. <clears throat> now the legs are optional. We really use them when you when you're pounding the bank. But if you're going to fish this thing uh, as a stonefly imitation rather than as a big ugly whatever the heck you want to call it, um, you you you'll want to have the legs on there as a big and ugly. And as a small stonefly imitation and a smaller application, leave the rubber legs off. Anyway, now I'm going to wrap my thread forward and I'm going to leave it hang right here. Let me pull this up out of the way. I'll leave it hang right here in front, slightly back from the hook eye. Do not want to crowd that hook eye. I'm being very careful to not allow that to happen. And the next thing to go on the hook will be my chenille. Well, sorry, I bumped the camera there, folks. I'm trying to make everybody get, I'm trying to make you seasick out there. The camera gets to bouncing around and it'll make you seasick. Well, we don't want that to happen if we can help it. But now I want you to notice how I'm working that chenille around those rubber legs. See how that, how that goes and we'll make in fact i'll leave it turn like this so you can see what we're doing and now we're right here i've got to be real careful i want to wrap that tight against those legs to kind of push them back just ever so slightly see how that kind of brings them a little bit um, more perpendicular or 90 degrees to the hook shank the ones in the back aren't well i want the ones in the back to slightly taper towards the back of the fly the ones in the front what i want them to do is be like this and then to kick back like that as they go through the water and they'll all get, come together like that and then and pop apart now not only is this fly incredibly good for browns on the yellowstone river or wherever you're you're trout fishing it's incredibly good for bass and bluegill 
bluegill just love this. Of course, I haven't found a bluegill that didn't like a rubber leg fly of some type or another. I want you to notice how I'm wrapping that thread back against that chenille and kicking it back there. I want, want this bare or this area right here to be void of any of the waste from the chenille. So let me just trim that off, set that aside. Now it's time to wrap my hackle. And remember, I've got that little, little tiny bit of bare stem that will keep me from having fibers poking up in, into, my, into the tail of my, of my fly. All right, there we go. All right, now we're going to tie this material happens to be hackle now. Remember, two turns, tying off the hackle, pull it back, dog leg the hackle or the material, whatever it might be, starting at the hook eye and then building each subsequent turn further back on the hook so that it dog legs that hackle back. See how that kicks that back? It's anchored from two directions, and yet we still keep a nice, delicate application on our head. We don't have material stuck in it all over the place. So let me trim that off. Now, tomorrow in Key West, or not in Key West, in Key Largo, we're going to go into detail in doing a proper whip finish. So we'll uh, just do one tonight. But I want you to notice that the thread is starting on the back of the eye. In fact, let me zoom in closer so that you can see this a little bit. Let me move my focus point on the camera. There we go. Now I want you to notice that the first turn of the whip finish is back on the eye. Take a turn. The next turn is slightly closer to the eye. In other words, each subsequent turn gets closer to the eye, but you start the turns back at the back part of the head, and I'm going to make three turns. Then I'm going to let that slide under those three turns. What's really important, if you don't do it that way, you'll end up with the thread laying across those turns before it goes under, and that's a weak spot in your, in your fly. The way I just did it, I've got three turns protecting the moving turn or the moving strand or whatever you want to call it. Let me, um, there we go. I'll just tilt this up so you can see. And that is a yuck bug. Well, then we're going to take it to the next step, which is back to the vise. Now let's get rid of this. We're going to increase the difficulty just a little bit, not a lot, but just a little bit. I think you have to agree that that was fairly easy. You know, it just should, it was basically a woolly bugger with some rubber legs put on it. And we didn't use marabou in the tail, we used squirrel tail. Let's see, we're going to uh, tie the first of the muddler versions. This one is going to be a very simple muddler that I would say just about everybody on this call would find pretty easy to do. Now, what I'm gonna to do to start this one though, is instead of starting here where I did on the other one, which was just back from the hook eye, I'm gonna move back to about that position right there. I need to have some room for my muddler head. So now I'm just gonna pick up the process here. You already know how this works, so I'm not gonna waste a lot of time. And I won't be putting um, rubber legs on this version. And I'll get some of this squirrel tail right here over the waistband. Alrighty, there we go. Now I'm going to take my hackle. I had this one left over from the last fly, so I'll just take and tear off the, the fibers there. And remember, I want that bare stem a little bit above the hook there. So I'm just going to put it in there about like that giving myself plenty of space there. I won't have any fibers getting back into my tail. Now on this one, I am going to be using some of that yarn that we straightened with the heat gun as my body material.
Okay. Now we're just going to wrap this forward. I, I want you to notice how nice and flat that is. That was just crinkled up yarn a few minutes ago until the heat gun hit it. And that makes a pretty smooth body, doesn't it? Not bad at all. All right, there it's going. I'm going to wrap my hackle forward to meet the thread. I made a mistake there. I want you to notice that I started to do that right there. Notice that I didn't make my first turn at the back of the hook. Mistake. Simple though that may be, the, the dividing line between the body and the tail should have a turn of hackle on it. There we go. Notice that I wrap two turns and then I wrap back against it. Well, I need to go back against it just a little bit more. It's not bent back enough to my way of liking. Here we go. There we go. That's better. Now on this one, even though we call it a muddler, the head is not made out of spun hair and we don't have a, a hair collar. We're gonna have another kind of a collar. And in fact, I've got a, some soft tackle here. This is from the breast of the bird and this is the chickaboo part and this is from the, the crotch area of the bird. Well, I'm gonna be using just one of these soft tackle feathers right here. Here's one, I'll just pull it out. And that'll be my collar rather than a deer hair. We'll use the deer hair on the last more difficult one that we're gonna do. All right, now I'm just going to, I notice I pulled those fibers back and right here on the tip, I'm gonna trim that off. So I have a dual triangle shape there. That just helps me anchor that hackle in. All right, and I'm just going to start dressing these fibers back as I wrap around the hook. Now I want you to notice I'm taking my scissors and just stroking along the feather to bend those fibers back just a little bit. What that does is make those makes those those uh, fibers lay a lot nicer as I wrap this the hackle back or I wrap the hackle in the place I want it to fold back into a wet style collar. See, I got those. So both tilted back just a little bit, makes it go on a lot nicer. And we'll see how that is. See how it starts to fold those fibers back. And just stroking it a little bit with my scissor points, or if you're a little bit dangerous with your scissor points, then don't use them. Uh, use the edge of your, like a, my tweezers. You could use the edge of a tweezer and stroke it along the, the feather just as easily. Okay, two turns of thread to anchor that, pull it back. And you see how it pulls that back into a really nice collar? I got one wild fiber there, I'll fix it. Okay, now we have a lot of room here left for our muddler head. Okay, now I'm just going to <clears throat> tie on this uh, straightened yarn. Now this, this yarn, I've already, I want you to notice that I snarled it real bad here. I've already weakened it because I tore some of the fibers out of it. And I, I might have some trouble wrapping that if I don't strengthen it in some way. And what I'm gonna to do to strengthen it is pull the, the yarn and my thread together. Now I have the strength of the thread supporting the yarn. I'll wrap the two together. And what I'm doing now is building up my muddler head 
out of yarn. I bet you thought the muddler head had to have had to be done out of deer hair? No, I don't think so. Two turns, remember two turns, pull it back, wrap a thread head in a jam knot right in front of it, forcing the fibers to go back. I'll trim that off. and get my whip finish tool out. And we've already been through the whip finish routine, so you don't need to see it again. We'll just go ahead and place my turns right there, starting at the back of the head and working my way forward. And now there is a wet muddler that um, wasn't too much harder to tie than the original. We just wrap some yarn for the muddler head instead of the spun head, which we will be doing next. Now remember, this is our this this is the, the roadmap fly, if you will, and that's the direction we're going. Looks pretty similar to this one, a little bit a little bit different size of head and everything, but um, as you can see, them they have some similarities. They're definitely cousins, but this guy right here that's in the vise right now. Um, tends to fish higher in the water column or on the top. And it's the version that I like to tie down into the 14 and 16 range to fish as small stone flies. Fish is really good for that. All right. Now that's quite a difference now. Let me, let me pull these two up. That's quite a difference between a strip it through the water column and a floating on top, basically from the same design, same materials. The only thing that's an addition is uh, is the hair. But let's get the hook in the vise. Now I need to leave my, a little bit more room in front this time than I did on the last one because that hair takes up a lot of space. So I won't start here like I did on the first fly and I won't start uh, like I did on the second fly, I'm going to move back just a tiny bit further, more like about a third of the shank. So this distance from here to here, my scissor points, is about one third of the distance from here to here. Well, I'll just go ahead and get some thread on the <clears throat> on the hook shank. And I'll get myself a <clears throat> some squirrel tail. By the way, this using the heat from a heat gun or from a from a hair dryer. It's not my idea. There's a fly tire on YouTube. His name is um, Davy McPhail. He's from Scotland. He's a commercial tire, and this is one of the things that he came up with. And I, I'm always willing to to use something. To, there's a good idea out there. I I'll use it. Anyway, I'm going to cut cut off a bundle clean out the waste cleaning out the waste let's talk about that for a minute there's a lot of crud down in here you can see in fact there's a lot of crud here it's a lot thicker here than it is here on the tips well we only want to I'll grab it right there about where that black band starts and then i'm just going to start rapidly moving my finger up and down through that and what that does is knock it loose and once it gets knocked fairly fairly much loose i'm able to pull most of it out All right, now we're going to measure that for length. I'm going to make this one a little bit shorter. It's going to be that I want that black to be the just sticking out from 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 the body. So I will cut off the waist and tie that in place. <clears throat> Now I want you to notice that I've at the compared to well like this tail here. This tail is a little the tail and one that I'm holding in my right hand is a little fuller, a little longer, and this one's a little shorter, more of a dry fly kind of a tail. This one's more of a wet fly kind of a tail. 
This one's a lot fuller. It's going to work in the water column. This one's going to be sitting on top of the water column. Okay. <clears throat> Get my hackle. And I think I've got just about enough to, that's too small. Let's get another one. That looks pretty good. What am I looking for when I said it's too small? Look at these fibers. I'll bend the fibers here. And then look how long they are. You can see that, I, that I've bent them. And the longest fibers there in the picture are about one and one half times the gap of the hook give or take. That, that's what we want. Sorry for bumping the camera there, folks. Remember, I want to leave the space here at the back so I don't have fibers sticking up right next to the body. Now, I had planned to use brown yarn, but I happened to mess, mess up the brown yarn really bad. I'm just going to use some chenille. Now, of course, you you and I both know it take a heck of a lot of um, of um, fly float to make that chenille not become waterlogged. But we're just showing you how to tie the fly. But I would definitely be using the yarn in the straightened yarn rather than the chenille on any dry fly. Notice that I stripped them down to the down to the threads. <clears throat> well, I'll just wrap this forward. To make my body. And I could have dubbed that body too had I wanted. Now what I don't want to do is this is this is a place I could really get into trouble because I could wrap down into there and tie it off. And what would happen is I start using up the space that I really need for the hair. And in fact, I'm going to leave some of those fibers sticking out and showing because you're going to see pretty quick once I spin that hair in front and push it back into place, it will no longer uh, show even at all, not even a little bit as far as is um, it'll be all covered up by the deer hair. There we go. But you see, I'm still have that little bit of uh, squirrel tail showing right there. I have not crowded over, no material creep sleeping, slipping up over, over that. I want you to notice that I put my thread back up on top. I wanna make sure that nothing slips forward. I'm protecting that area where my, where, where my hair collar is going to go. And it's very easy when you start working with hair to have, it, um, have that area get used up. And all of a sudden you don't have space. Now. Trim that off. Now I'm going to allow my thread to come forward in front of that squirrel tail. And I'm just gonna take a, a two turn whip finish right there. just to make sure that it doesn't slip around. And and now we need to talk about animal hair for just a minute. Let's get back over to the materials. Let's set aside the the uh, the hackle. And I've already treated both of these pieces of hair with static garden. Static electricity is a is a major enemy to anybody tying with <clears throat> animal hair, whether it's squirrel tail or deer hair. What I wanted you to notice here, let's look at that hair. You can see that there's quite a difference in the color of this hair down in here as compared to here. This hair is darker. It's darker here. And then as it moves down here, I want you to notice You've got a, a piece of stem. No, oh, that's at least half the stem. that has got a darker band in here. But as we go further down this way, the, the band gets shorter and the light part of the band gets bigger and bigger. You get down to here and there's almost no dark band and almost all light. Well, let's take a look at a picture of a deer hide. 
This is a picture of a deer hide, white tail. The dark down the backbone is what you want for wings and tails on hair wing flies. The further down the rib you go, whether it's back here towards the flank or up towards the front, the lighter hair is here. And that's the spinning hair that we, and that's the, in fact, the hair that we want tonight. If we, if we had been tying, let's say a humpy or a wolf, we'd be taking hair out of the middle, the dark stuff. But we don't need the dark stuff tonight. So I'll lay that aside. And in fact, I don't even need this dark stuff here. I am going to be taking my hair out of down in this area where I've got, it's, it's very light and it has flare. And you're going to see, we're going to need that flare. And we'll use that to our advantage. <clears throat> Let me grab my scissors and I'll start. <clears throat> and I'll just cut a bundle out right about here. Now, I've, I'm going to grab that hair right out here on the tips again. And I want you to notice how much wider it is out here. Let me get this up here so you can see how much wider it is at the base end than it is at the tip end. Some of that is, is because of the structure of the hair, but mostly the extra dimension there is because of waste, fur, short fibers, etc. Well, I move my fingers rapidly up and down through those base ends, and you can see it's already starting to work it out. I don't want to get it all over the all over the place here, but it, it works it out of there. And it doesn't build up static electricity. Re remember, we're trying to get rid of static electricity. That's why we use this stuff. And if you stroke, stroke, stroke like that to pull the stuff out, you build up static electricity because you're lining those little electrons up. And that's what causes the static electricity. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go out over my waste bin and rapidly run my finger up and down through here to get rid of the waste. And I'll see you back over at the tying vise in just a moment. And now you can see that there's very few fibers and short, short things in there. It's just all the, all the hair that we need. And notice that except for the part that I'm grabbing right there, it's almost all of it, that light color. That's spinning hair. Remember, light is spinning and dark as wings and tails. <clears throat> and let me get my hair stacker. Yeah, I know my hair stacker is a piece of junk, but I made it. I've had it for 40 years and I love that darn thing. All right. I want you to notice that I'm taking the hair out of the stacker with the tips pointing in the direction that they're going to go on the hook. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen tires do this. Okay, they always pull the hair out of the stacker the same way. And then they say, oh, darn, I got to turn that around. So then they have to try to turn it around and, well, they make a mess. Like I just did. Now we're going to have to put that back in the stacker and restack it because they didn't, didn't have it going in the direction it needed to go. By the way, I apologize to all of you. You probably have all seen this before. You, if you watched our, our presentations, you know, the truth of the matter is thread goes on the hook two ways, clockwise, counterclockwise. Materials get clamped in, in place by, by turns of thread. And that's it. No big rocket science about that stuff. And no matter how many of these things I've tied, it's still, you get down to the fact that it's just uh, pieces of thread holding pieces of material into place. Now I want that to be about that long. So I am going to cut off the excess and I'm gonna give myself a little bit of extra. Well, I, again, I don't wanna get this all over the camera. So I'm gonna reach down off, off camera here and get over the waste bin. And now I've got that cut off. And I want you to notice how I kind of squirm that down around the hook. That's so that I can put three snug but not tight turns. And now I'm going to start to tighten and let go at the same time and let it spin. Let's see, did we get a pretty good spin on that? Let's take a look. Um, yeah, that's pretty good. But one of the things about if you don't make it real tight, the spin, 
you can adjust that here <clears throat> so it's evenly placed around the hook. Now I can use my thumbnail or I can use a hair packing tool to push this back. And I'll pull my thread in front of the spun hair and make a couple of turns. And I want you to notice that those turns, let me turn this so you can see it better, that I'm slightly forward to that spun hair. I'm not tied up against it. I wanna be slightly forward. I wanna have space for the next bundle of hair to spin, not to try to spin it against uh, the wall, if you will. So I'm gonna move this forward even just another turn more so you can see what we're doing there. There you go, you can see that a lot better now. <clears throat> now I'm just gonna reach over and get myself another bundle of this hair. <clears throat> Three turns, cut off the waist this time and spin that into place. Let me see if I got any space left here for another spin. Get my hair packing tool. Yeah, I think I'll just get another one in there. And I'm just gonna use the hair that was left over from the last spin, um, I, I, the piece that I cut off, I'm just going to go ahead and put that in place there. And that one, you notice I had to spin it right up against the wall of the previous turn because there was almost no space left and it didn't want to turn around the hook. So then you can just twist it into place. See how I did that? So that I get an even distribution and you can see that that distribution now is pretty good. And I am going to use a half hitch tool now to place a whip finish. And you're probably saying, what? Well, there's the half hitch first. Second half hitch. So how do you do a whip finish with a half hitch tool? If you don't have a bead on the hook, it's real easy. If you have a bead on the hook, it's impossible. What you do is you take not one turn like you would for a half hitch, but you take two or three turns. I'll do two turns. Slide those into place. There's a, there's a whip finish. I'll put on another one here, just to be sure. And I'll trim off the thread, set that aside. Notice how I'm kind of fuzzing up all those wild, wild ends. That's because now I'm gonna start by trimming flat along the bottom. Let me get my basting brush out. By the way, what I have found is, is absolutely the best brush for cleaning up around your tying area. A regular paintbrush is too stiff and it flips stuff in places that you don't want it. This is a basting brush from the chef's store. And that works really good for cleanup. It just sweeps things out of the way really nice without flipping it all, all over the place that, where you didn't want it to go. Okay, I'm just kind of cleaning up now. I'll just set that down because I'm gonna need it here in a minute. And I'm gonna start by trimming flat along the bottom. And because this is a fly that I'm going to want to have have, a, have contact with the water, it's going to be maybe a dry fly or something like that. I'm also going to trim the hackle off the bottom. Now I'll get my basting brush in here to clean out the fibers I don't want to get rid of and all those that are falling on the table. Now, Many fly tires run into a problem at this point. Let me turn this hook so you can see. Okay, there you're looking at it. It's really tough to trim this so it's nice and round. 
and there's a trick to it. And the trick is, I'm going to take this out of the vise right now. Get it so you can see it a little bit better there. What I'm going to do is cut a straight cut here, another one on top, and one on the side. In other words, it's easier to keep things in proportion by making a straight cut rather than trying to make a whole series of round cuts. Then once you've squared it up, knock the corners off and you have a nice even head. So let me put that back in the vise. And I'm just going to go over to the flip it up where it was before. Now I'm just going to make a quarter turn. Just a straight cut. Now let's make another turn and I'll be trimming the top. Now, rather than making a straight cut straight in like this, I'm going to angle this one slightly down. Like that. See that making those straight cuts is pretty easy though, isn't it? And now we're going to go over to the far side. And now this will be a straight cut. Get my basting brush out. <clears throat> okay. Now I'm going, now I'm going to start to round it off. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start here on the on the very bottom offside and do knock that corner off. Now I'm just going to turn in this corner that I have uh, between the offside and the top. I'm going to cut that one off. Okay, now here's the, the corner that I need to knock off between the near side and the top. And now the last one is the one right along the near side and the bottom. Now we have some waste right along here. It's kind of mixed into our collar and I'll show you how to get that right now. Let's see if I can do it with, yeah, you're gonna be able to see. I was concerned because usually the way I do it is like this. And, and what do you see? All you see is the scissors in my hand. I am going to twist this around a little bit. What you do is you take the scissors and lay them in here flat like that, push back on the scissors, and the scissors pushes the longer collar out of the way and allows the shorter fibers to show through so you can cut them. See that? And uh, just work our way around, trimming them out. There we go. That looks pretty good. Now I'm just going to trim it up to make it look pretty. Use the rotating feature of my device to get any wild hairs that need to be taken care of. Yeah, I got one right here that I want to... There, that looks better. Whoops, sorry for hitting the camera there, folks. Let me get my real close-up glasses now to just verify that I don't have any wild fibers that need to be taken care of. Oh, that, there's one right there. There's one right here at the front. And I think I'm going to call that good for now. Any questions from all of you? Somebody must have typed a question here. I have to take a look and see what it says. In fact, I've got several chats. So I'll just take a look at those real quick. While you all are thinking of your questions, I'll um, see if there's anything in the chat that I need to see. So this looks oh, that. Kate Lodge says, this looks awesome. But I, I first glanced at it, and I, Kate Lodge says, this looks awful, Al. Oh, no. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Love the yarn effect. Wonderful detailing, kiddos. The trimming lesson was awesome. Ah, thanks. Anyway, back to that, the trimming. I cannot tell you how many 
really great muddlers I've seen that look perfect until you looked at the head. You said, looks good from the side. You look look at it from the front. In one side is lop, it's lopsided. Not, it's very poorly trimmed. All you got to do is cut the side square and then trim, knock the corners off. And that'll do it for you. Questions? Al? Yeah. Would you spin a little hair using the rotary function? I sure will. <clears throat> Let me go back to the vice. Using your rotary vice for something other than looking at the other side. I cannot tell you how many folks have, oh, we wrote a book because of the, what, what I'm gonna to explain to you right now. Let me get a, get, get a hook out here. And I need to just get this lined up a little bit better. I want you to notice that I got that hook so it, uh, now when I rotate the vise, I, know, I want you to notice that the shank stays pretty much in line. That's called on rotation or inline rotation. It's called both, but I call it on rotation. And uh, spinning hair is a challenge for many people. And I'll show you why it's a challenge. And then I'll show you um, a way you can use your rotary vise to do more than just look at the other side of the fly. First off, I am going to put some thread right here at the back of the hook. Several turns, nice and tight. I have a couple of chats. Let me take a quick look, make sure I'm not missing something. That... When you were using the half hitch, Linda Miller said, you said you couldn't do it with a bead head. What does that mean? Linda, what that means is that you have a bead right at the hook eye on there when you're tying a bead headed fly and you cannot slip half hitches or whip finishes around the head because the whip finish is placed behind the bead. Evelyn Adams, it's hard to trim my drawing, but your steps are explained and demonstrated. <laughs> okay, Evelyn, I do understand that probably is pretty hard to do. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, back here. I'm just gonna go over here and get a bundle of hair. You know where I'm getting, I'm getting hair that spins. And I'm just going to clean the waste out of this. I need to get some more static guard out. I will here in just a minute. The first bundle I'm going to do on this, I'm going to do a Goddard caddis, which is a, an all spun fly. Because I'm just going to spin, not, not spin, I'm going to flare this hair in place. And I want you to notice that I'm holding tight with my left hand. I want you to notice my trigger finger right there. I'm poking it with my scissors. See how I roll that? That little maneuver right there don't look like much. It's the difference between success and failure with a lot of hair wing tying. As I tighten the thread, I roll that finger into place. That's what keeps the hair from going down on the other side. Now I'm gonna exaggerate it and probably mess it up, but I'm starting to tighten and that hair will twist away from me. So I don't want it to twist away. So I. Tighten it in place by, by rolling my finger in there and making it, forcing it to stay on top. All right, I'll trim off the waist. Okay, now remember, I don't want to, I don't want to spin my hair up against the wall. And what's the wall? If you don't remember, the wall is the previous bundle that I spun. So I'm going to wrap forward just slightly so that I'm slightly in front. I think you can see that now. Not a long ways, but just enough to give my hair a chance to spin. All right, I'm gonna get another bundle of hair and I'm gonna pause on the way back to the vise and clean the waist out. Whoops, I have to, I've gotta get some static guard out. It's starting to stick to me real bad. <clears throat> and, uh, Okay, there we go. If you've got a bundle of hair that you say it won't it won't stack, it sticks to things, it's uh, just a bad piece of hair, it's too greasy and too sticky, is what you probably were thinking to yourself, um, then uh, make sure that it's not static electricity that you're dealing with. 
and I'll guarantee at least here in the Rocky Mountain West, where it's where it's dry desert country, I'll tell you what the um, static electricity will drive you absolutely crazy. But I got rid of it just now. I sprayed it down with some static guard, and that that helped. All right. Now I'm going to spin this one by hand and explain the spinning process. Then we're going to spin it with the vise. So first off, I'll just set that on the side of the hook next to me. Three snug but not tight turns. I'm going to cut off the waist. Throw that away. Okay. Keep that thing from swinging. What I'm going to do now to spin hair and successfully distribute it all the way around the hook, you have to increase the pressure gradually as you bring the thread around the hook. And you have to ever increasingly increase that pressure, if you will, as you make that. And at some point, the tension on the thread is going to be enough to cause the hair to, to flare and, and uh, rotate. So I'm going to start to do that. And I'm going to gradually, I'm gradually increasing, increasing. It's starting to turn, increase more, 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 more. And now it's spun. And I got a good application there because I did a good, even application of increased pressure on the thread. Take a look there. You can see that I've got a good, a good distribution of hair. Now, let me get my bundle here or my packer and push it back. But that's where most people have trouble. If you're a fairly inexperienced fly tire, that gradual increase of pressure um well it, it often happens and here's how it happens is you get over to this side right here and you're not putting as much pressure on as you were over here and that uneven application of pressure causes uneven distribution of the hair now i'm going to show you how to beat that beat that problem i'll just get another bundle of hair oh good the static guard is taking into effect this is good and I'm over the waist bin right now, cleaning out the waist. <clears throat> okay. Three snug but not tight turns, cut off the waist, throw it away. Now, here's what we're gonna do. I am going to hold onto this thread tight and not allow my hand to move at all. And as I turn the vise, it gradually increases the tension because the thread is getting gradually shorter and shorter and shorter as I rotate the vise. So the vise will be increasing the pressure. And if I hold my hand steady, I'll get even application of pressure, increasing application of pressure all the way around the hook. So we'll, here's what you wanna watch. I laid my scissors down because I'm gonna grab my bobbin now and thread and hold it. And I'm gonna to have to move off camera just slightly so I can pinch the bobbin. Now I'm holding that steady. I want you to notice I'm also holding it slightly back. That's so it doesn't fall off the hook. Now I'm gonna to start to rotate, rotate, tighten, tighten, tighten. It's getting ready to spin. And there, it spun right there. You see that? Just the gradual increase of the, see that? And it's a nice even spin all the way around the hook. Now let me work my way in front of that bundle, push it back. Work my thread forward, get another bundle of hair. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I am going to move over the waist bin again and clean out the under fur and short fibers. Now, I'm not even going to take time to explain it to you now. You know that I'm just going to be increasing the pressure on the thread, which increases the pressure on the hair, as I rotate the vise. And I do that by just keeping my hand stationary. Done. Go on to the next one. It's as simple as that. In fact, it's easier to do that without talking about it because you're just allowing the vice to do its thing rather than rather than having it uh, uh, having to explain it and try to slow it down and everything. 
Now I'll explain my way through this last one before we get to the trimming process. Okay, now, again, I'm just going to hold it tight and start turning. And it just distributes the hair around the hook. All right, let's... Uh, <clears throat> Now I'm just going to go ahead and whip finish this off real quick because we're going to do a quick trim and then we'll put some hackle on this Goddard caddis. By the way, if you're interested, uh, the Goddard caddis was developed by a fellow by the name of John Goddard and he's from the UK. Not that that makes any difference, but anyway. Anyway, we start the trim of this. Let me get my uh, my chef's brush out again my basting brush, set that aside because I'm going to need it. I'm going to start by trimming flat along the hook. Now the Goddard caddis is trimmed at an angle like this. So it's wider at the back, narrower towards the, towards the hook eye. So what I'm going to do now is just start Rot slowly rotating my vise and, and, and trimming. The other way I can get a nice even trim is by having my hook on axis on on line. I get a nice trim because I don't allow my hand to move as I rock that vise back and forth. Trimming. See how easy that is. Now I'll get the wild ones that. I have a real mess right down here, but that's what the basting brush is for. We'll just sweep all that up into the waste bin, keep it off the camera. Maybe I better brush the camera off too. There we go. All right, now we're going to put the, the hackle on this. And um, And we'll show you another thing about your rotary vise here. <clears throat> Means that probably some of you have got rotary vices. You may as well learn a couple of little tricks about them. And they all have this next feature that we're going to talk about. Let's start by attaching our hackle. That looks pretty good. Tied into the place. Remember, I need to leave some bare stem. <clears throat> All right, and I'm going to just do a half hitch so it doesn't come, so it doesn't come undone. We're going to talk about another de another device that gets misused very often, and that's this little guy right here. Let me let me get him back here, and that's a thing people call it a bobbin rest. Okay, but they actually end up using it as a thread rest. As they they pull their thread out and lay it over just like just like I did just right here. Let me pull that bobbin. Okay, you can see the bobbin and the rest. In fact, I am going to Gretchen. Don't let me forget to put this back in the middle where it should be. I'll move this over just a little bit so you can see what we're doing. There we go. We've got the thread pretty much in line with the hook shank and the bobbin hanging over it. It's, there we go. And I would just go ahead and if I was gonna do my hackle, I would start rotating the vise and doing the hackle. And I'm not gonna do that right now because I'm gonna do some other things. And when I get to the front, I'd stop and say, oh, okay, well now it's time to tie off the hackle. So I'd take my thread off the rest, push the rest out of the way. I say, oh, darn, I need to, well, it, the thread's too long. So now I've got to take and twist the 
the spool up to get my my thread back to its working length. Okay. Well, let me show you what you should be doing with your bobbin rest. Keyword bobbin, not thread, is first off, lower it just a little bit. Leave your thread on the bobbin at working length and just set it on the bobbin rest like that. I don't know if you can see, but what I did is I just dropped it down a little bit. And as I drop it down, now I still have my working length thread on my bobbin. But I didn't, I'm not going to have to crank it back up. Now I'm just going to go ahead and wrap the hackle forward using the rotating feature of the vise. <clears throat> okay. Now here we're at a place where you can do whatever you want. Most people would at this point start to pass the thread over to tie off the, the, the hackle. Well, let's just leave that hang there for a minute. Hang on to the thread or onto the feather. Or you keep rotating the vise two more turns and you just tied the feather off. Now, and I only two, wrapped it, made it go around twice. That means I've got two turns of thread, just like I, I wanted in the first place. Now I'll pull my hackle back. Wrap the thread head and a jam knot that dog legs that hackle back. So I have a nice delicate head. I got one wild fiber there. Let's get my other glasses so I can see better. There we go. And I want you to notice, let me pull this back. that I have a nice clean head. When I get when I get ready to put my whip finish on. I don't have a bunch of fibers caught in that head. All you have to do is do the dog leg routine to get a nice clean head rather than a head that's got a bunch of fibers trapped in it. Notice that I did not snip my, my thread. I just jammed it up there and let the crotch of the two blades coming together cut it. I'm gonna do the same thing with the feather. And there we've got a Goddard caddis.